Hello and welcome to this video in which we will show how the output of a discrete time linear time invariant system is found as the convolution of its input and of a function called its impulse response. This turns out to be a very useful property of linear time invariant systems. So to set the stage, we have here an example of a system, or we have some arbitrary system, LTI, stands for linear time invariant. We have a delta function going in, and we have some function h of n coming out. And because this is the response to a delta function, which we also call an impulse, we say this is the impulse response. And it turns out that if we know the impulse response, we can actually find how this system will respond to an arbitrary input. So I have some arbitrary input x of n. That gives me some arbitrary output y of n. It turns out that y of n is equal to x of n convolved. That's a star for those of you that don't recognize that. It looks more like a smashed bug, but it's a star. So it's x of n convolved with h of n. Okay, uh, This does not mean multiplication. In this context, a star between two uh, signals means that they're being convolved. So by the end of the video, or, or in this video, we'll go through an example. And by the end of the video, you'll have a better understanding of what this convolution operator is. So this is an important thing to understand because it says for, if I have a linear time invariant system, I can figure out its response to any input as long as I know its impulse response. Uh, this has implications for frequency domain analysis. It has implications for Z-transform domain analysis. And for discrete time systems, it turns out this is actually important in terms of how we compute the output of a system given an input. In discrete time systems, quite often we compute the convolution, uh, particularly if you've ever heard the term FIR, which stands for a finite impulse response. It's a type of filter. An FIR filter is actually implemented by uh, implementing this convolution directly on a, a microprocessor or a DSP chip or something like that. So let's try to figure out how this works by doing an example. Okay, and the example I'll use, we'll assume that we know the impulse response of the system, and it's given by this h of n. So the impulse response is a 1 at time 0, a minus 1 at time 1, and 1 half at time 2. And let's suppose that the input that we want the um, system to respond to, that we want to compute its response to, is this x of n which at 0 is 1, at 1 is 2, at 2 is 3, at 3 is 2, at 4 is 1 again, and 0 everywhere else. Okay. Well, the way we're going to do this may seem uh, quite strange for a while, but we're going to take our signal x of n, and we're going to write it in a very complicated way. And I'll explain by, by the end of the video, hopefully this will make sense. Okay, we're going to write it as a sum from k going from minus infinity to infinity, x of k delta of n minus k. And what we're really doing here is the following. We're saying, uh, for example, at time 0, so when n is equal to 0, I'm going to represent this particular piece of xn by x of 0, which in this case would be 1, times delta of 0. Okay. Um, when n is equal to 1, I'm going to represent this part of the signal by x of 1 delta, and actually this shouldn't be delta of 0, this should be delta of n, delta of n minus 1, okay? 
So the idea is I'm taking my input signal and I'm breaking it up into a, a quantity or a, a factor times a delta function. And this delta function has been shifted to be whatever, you know, for example, when I do n is equal to 2, I'll have delta of n minus 2. And I'll have a value of 3 times that delta of n minus 2 because x of 2 is 3. So the idea is I take my x and break it up into um, unit step function or unit impulse functions. And then conceptually what I'm going to do, because I have a linear time invariant system I can do this, is I'll take this guy and run it through my system. And it turns out that the output in response to this guy is just going to be this h of n. Okay. Then I'll take this guy and run it through my system. And the impulse or the response to this, it, since I have two times a delta function and the delta function is shifted to the right by one, the output in response to this guy is going to be h of n times 2 shifted to the right by 1. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm trying to imply here. I'll take this whole chunk here, I'll multiply it by 2, and then shift it to the right by 1. So hopefully you see the pattern to get the response to this 3 times a delta function at time 2. I'll take my impulse response, I'll multiply it by 3, and I'll shift it 2 to the right. Okay, so I'm going to break up my input into values uh, of x times a shifted delta function. I'll run each of these through individually, and each of them will give me a particular, uh, it will give me a shifted version and a scaled version of the impulse response. I know that this will happen because I have systems that are linear and time invariant. And then what I'll do is for each value of n, I'll just sum up each of the contributions um, due to these different delta functions. So let's actually, I've tried to illustrate this in this uh, graph, okay? So this guy here, 1, this is x of 0, and this is h of n minus 0. Now that's kind of a dumb way to write it, but the idea is that I've taken x of 0, I've taken my impulse response and not shifted it, and this is what I have here. Okay, when I do the case where I'm looking at uh, x of 1, this 2 is x of 1, and I've now shifted this to the right, or I've shifted the delta, the impulse response uh, to the right by one. So you can see I've taken this guy, which was my original impulse response, multiplied it by two, so it's bigger, and shifted it to the right by one. And similarly, uh, this three is x of two, h of n minus two. Okay, I've taken this guy, multiplied it by three, and shifted to the right by two. Okay, this is x of 3, h of n minus 3. Again, I've taken my impulse response, multiplied it by 2, because that's what x of 3 is, and shifted it to the right by 3. And finally, x of 4 times h of n minus 4. And again, this is my impulse response multiplied by 1, which is x of 4, and shifted to the right by 4. My output at any given point in time, so let's say y of 0, y of 0 will be the sum of everything, or each of these values at 0. Okay, And the reason that's true is I've taken my x, I've broken it up into a sum of these scaled delta functions, I run each of these guys through the system individually, but um, if I'm trying to find the response to the sum, then basically what I'll have is the sum of each of the individual responses. So y0, this is the only non-zero term that shows up, and that's equal to 1. 
Uh, let's see, let's find another beautiful color, y of 1. Okay, well, for y equals 1, I have this negative 1, and I have this positive 2, everything else is 0. So I'll have negative 1 plus 2, and this will be 1. Hopefully you're beginning to see the way this works. For y of 3, well, I have this term of a half, I have this term of negative 2, and this term of positive 3, so I'm going to have 1 half minus 2 plus 3, which if I, is that minus 2 or, yeah, that should be minus 2. So we have 1 half minus 2 plus 3, and that gives me then a 1 and 1 half. Okay. Whoops, y of 3, how did I get that? It should be y of 2. Okay, y of 3. Well, at time 3 I have this guy which has a value of 1, this guy which has a value of negative 3, and this guy which has a value of positive 2. So, if I'm correct, then um, this guy here should be 0. Okay, sorry for that spastic moment there. The phone just rang and uh, I had to look at it and decide not to answer. I was a telemarketer. So anyway, going quickly now, because uh, I just wasted a whole bunch of time trying to decide whether to answer the phone, y of 4, we'll have this term here, which is 1 and a half, this term here, which is minus 2, this term here, which is 1, and we get then um, that this is 0.5, if I did that correctly. Then we'll have... Um, this term here and this term here, which is plus 1 and minus 1, so y of 5 will be 0. And finally, um, last but not least, y of 6 will be equal to 1 half. Okay. Now, um, hopefully this makes sense and you can see how this works. The last thing I want to do, which will uh, actually now develop the uh, convolution formula is point out that I could call these guys k so this would be the line for k is equal to 0 and I could call this guy k again and this would be the line for k is equal to 1 and so on I have a line for k is equal to 2 k is equal to 3 k is equal to 4, and so on. So what this allows me to do then is say that the output, the reason I want to do this is the output at any time n, so anywhere along these lines, is equal to the sum, I'm going to have k go from actually minus infinity to infinity. The reason I don't have it going from minus infinity to infinity here is first I can't draw an infinite number of lines above and an infinite number of lines below and uh, for those values that I've done here uh, those lines would all be zero anyway. Um, so I'll have k go from minus infinity to infinity x of k h of n minus k and I hope this, you can see then that what I've done here is, for example, when n is equal to 0, I basically will end up with this term. When n is equal to 1, I end up with this term plus this term, and so on. So basically what I've shown is that to get the output at a given time n, I can use this formula. Well, this formula is the magic formula. Another way of writing this formula is that y of n is 
the convolution of x of n with h of n. Okay, now this notation for convolution really stinks. It's awful. Um, it really doesn't give you a clear idea of what on earth is happening here. So what you really need to think in your mind is when you see this, what it really means is I'm going to compute y of n using this summation. And you shouldn't try to read too much into the fact that I have an x of n here or an h of n. You can see that in order to compute y of n, in principle, I have to look at every value of x and every value of h. So I don't compute y of n generally by just looking at x of n and h of n. I generally have to look at every value of x and every value of h. So hopefully this has made sense. Uh, we found this useful. What we've done, again, to uh, conclude is we have developed the fact that the output of an LTI system to an arbitrary input is given in terms of the impulse response and it's actually this convolution equation and we've actually defined then the summation that makes this convol or that defines this convolution equation so hopefully you found this useful thanks for what thanks for watching